Good morning everyone. Welcome to workshop 3. At the end of this workshop, you will be able to illustrate and explain the conceptual framework, presents written conceptual framework, defines terms used in the study, and lists research hypotheses. So let us go with the conceptual framework. So what is a conceptual framework? It is defined as it provides the theoretical foundation and structure for your research. It will help you define the key concept, variables, and relationships that guide your study. To discuss further, let us watch this video about conceptual framework. Hi! Welcome back to my channel. Sa lesson video na to, pag-uusapan natin kung paano gawin ang conceptual framework. I know you have an idea about it, pero magandang pag-usapan pa rin natin at baka mas maging madali sa'yo ang pagsusulat mo ng conceptual framework. Okay, so ano nga ba ang conceptual framework? So, unang-una, ang conceptual framework ay isang subtopic sa chapter 1. Karaniwan talaga nasa chapter 1 siya. Maaaring sa ibang paaralan ay nasa ibang chapter siya. Pero ito usually nasa chapter 1. Malapit siya sa SOP or Statement of the Problem at sa Theoretical Framework. Actually, sila yung mga magkakasunod dyan. Ang conceptual framework then ay isang visualization of connections of elements and flow of the study. Ano po ba yung mga elements, ma'am, na may mga connection dyan? So, sa pag-aaral ng research, syempre tinuturo ng ating guro, alin dyan yung dependent variable, alin dyan yung independent variable, kasi usually sila yung may mga connection. Halimbawa, inaral mo, ano nga ba ang epekto ng haba ng oras ng pag-review sa grade ng mga bata. So, yung dependent variable, eto yung nagiging reaction kapag binago mo or may pagbabago sa oras o dami ng oras ng pag-review. So, IV, DV. Usually, may mga relationships yan. Okay? Dapat malinaw mo siyang maipakita sa conceptual framework mo. Conceptual framework is also similar with the skeletal system of our body. So, yung buto natin, yung mga buto natin, yung struktura nila, may pagkakahalintula diyan sa conceptual framework. Alam mo na defined, ito yung structure, ito yung lalamanan. So, kaya kapag tinignan mo yung conceptual framework, ah, alam ko na, ito yung umpisa niyan, ito yung magiging actions taken dyan, at eto yung magiging resulta niyan. So, parang ganun, depende kung anong model yung gagamitin mo na akma sa study mo. Ganun din, para din siyang blueprint ng building. ba bago mo makita yung pinakang building, meron yung parang ginawa ng architect na eto, eto yung magiging hitsura niyan. So, kahit hindi mo pa nakita, kasi hindi naman pwedeng trial and error ang paggawa ng building, nakikita mo sa blueprint na, ah, eto, eto, tinatakbo niyan. Ganun din yung conceptual framework natin. Kaya, kapag tama, kapag malinaw, clear, and correct ang conceptual framework mo, ang linaw niyan sa'yo, ang linaw sa panel mo, ang linaw sa mga readers mo. And don't forget, it presents the quick guide on the direction of the study. Ikaw mismo, malinaw na malinaw sa'yo ang tinatakbo, ang direction ng study mo kung tama at talagang na-capture ng conceptual framework mo yung flow ng study mo. So, alam mo na ito ang una, ito mga materials dyan, ito mga gagawin, at ito magiging resulta dyan. Okay, so kumbaga naka-frame siya, may series siya, at alam mo yung mga relationships among those elements or details in your study. Okay, so ito yung mga topics natin dito sa lesson video na to. One, what are the format options? Two, what are the commonly used research models and when to use each type? Samples, magpapakita ako ng mga samples dito para kumbaga maging guide mo siya. Uh, ito, kahalintulad to ng study ko. So, most probably, ito yung 
conceptual framework. At syempre pa, tips para maging madali ang lahat. Kumbaga, kami nakagawa na maraming beses ng thesis. Nandiyan yung thesis, master's thesis, dissertation. So, kumbaga meron na dyang mga estratehiya, meron na dyang mga hidden knowledge. Ah, eto. Eto talaga yung magpapabilis para magawa ko kaagad yung conceptual framework ko. Format. So, there are two types of formats. So, one, nauuna yung paradigm, tapos explanation. So, makikita mo doon yung illustration at yung paliwanag. Yun yung isang uri. Yung isa, merong introductory paragraph, may paradigm, at may explanation. So, tatlong elements. Yung isa, two elements lang. Karaniwan, eto, etong nasa letter A. Pero kung ano yung itinakda sa paaralan nyo, syempre, yun yung susundin nyo. Kasi, bawat paaralan, may iba-iba silang pamamaraan or nakatakdang guidelines, rules, guides, para eto, eto, para mabuo nyo yung thesis nyo. Next, commonly used research models and when to use each. Practically speaking, ano-ano nga ba yung mga common research models? Uh, practically speaking, kailan mo gagamitin? Ito, itong IPO model, itong IVDV model, itong ADI model, at yung iyong self-made or researcher-made conceptual framework. Okay, narito na yung mga samples. Mas madali kasing maintindihan kapag may halimbawa nang nakikita. Definitely, sa pagsusulat ng conceptual framework, medyo final na yung title mo. di ba? Okay na yung title mo. Kaya dito sa halimbawa natin, meron na tayong title dito. Itong kulay pula. Halimbawa, ang study ay Service Delivery of Local Government Unit Frontline Workers kung saan mang municipality or probinsya yan. So, eto ang focus niya. Service delivery. Nino ng mga local government or LGU frontline workers. Or ang tawag nila frontliners. Pero check mo kung ano yung final or formal term. Kasi yun ang ilalagay natin sa iyong thesis. So, eto yung conceptual framework niya. Gumamit siya ng IPO. Bakit input process output? Kasi ang kanyang study ay tungkol sa service delivery. So, wala ka namang nakaka-apekto itong variable na to dito. Kaya, ang ginagamit usually kapag ganun ay input process output. So, dito sa input, nandyan yung profile of the respondents. Ano yung mga profile na kinonsider niya? Yung gender, yung age, monthly family income, highest educational attainment. So, ito yung mga common na profile. Pwedeng hindi mo kunin yung iba. Pwedeng dagdagan mo. Depende sa study mo at kung ano yung na-approve ng iyong panel. Yung aspects naman, yung service delivery. So, dito sa halimbawa natin, merong apat na aspects. Planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. Halimbawa lang ito, maaaring iba yung aspects mo dulot ng marami mong nabasa sa RRL mo. Ito kasi minsan yung nahihirapan yung mga researchers kasi ito yung ano ko ma'am, variable or focus. Ano po ba yung pwede kong ilagay dyan na aspects? Hindi pwede manghuhula tayo dito. Kasi kung ano yung sinasabi sa mga literature, ano yung sinasabi sa mga memoranda, ano yung sinasabi sa mga policy guides, or sa mga finished or published researches, yun ang gagawin mong aspects. Hindi ka manghuhula-hula. Kaya sinasabi na kapag susulat ka ng conceptual framework, dapat nakapagbasa ka na, kumbaga na buo mo na somehow yung RRL mo. Kasi dun ka nga kukuha. Dahil hindi pwedeng hula-hula. Sa experience ko sa defense, actually, dito sa aspects na to, natatagalan. Kasi tatanungin namin, oh, what are the aspects of the topic that you are proposing? Or the topic of your study? So, sabi niya, uh, ma'am, parang ano po, ganito. So, paano natin i-consider yung hindi ka sure? Parang ano po? Parang ano po? Ano yung basis mo? Nasaan yan sa iyong review of related literature? Kaya hindi pwedeng hula-hula. So, dapat nakapagbasa ng RRL, alam mo yung covered ng focus ng study mo. 
Okay, nandito yan sa input. Pagdating sa process, dahil ang study mo ay assessment ng service delivery, so assessment of yung title, paano mo siya in -assess? So, nag-survey ka, nag-documentary analysis ka, nag-interview ka, may focus group discussion ka, so malamang mixed method ka rito, kaya ka merong interview, may focus group discussion, Okay, may documentary analysis. So, ito karaniwan ay qualitative approach. Yung survey, quantitative yan. So, mixed methodology dito. Okay, so part of the process, of course, are the statistical analysis and thematic analysis. Kasi nga, mixed eh. Yung quantity data mo, gagamitan mo ng statistical analysis. Yung qualitative data mo, gagamitan mo ng thematic analysis. Okay? So, ganun pag nag-mix. Meron kang quantitative data, anong gagawin mo dyan? Meron kang qualitative data, anong gagawin mo dyan? Okay, so sa process yan, dito yan sa gitnang frame. Pagdating sa output, heto na. Eto na yung output mo. Assessed what? Bakit po assessed ma'am yung ginamit? Kasi assessment sa process mo. So, consistent. Okay? Assessed what? Assessed level of service delivery or assessed extent of service delivery. And of course, merong na-find out dyan na problema. Another output that you might be asked is to have your action plan. Depende. Depende sa kung ano yung recommendation ng panel mo. Okay? Pero part yan ng iyong conceptual framework. Kaya nga, Dito, sa conceptual framework, gaya ng nabanggit ko kanina, kita mo agad eh. Pagtingin mo sa input, ah, ito yung involved. Process, ah, anong gagawin? Ito yung mga gagawin. Siyempre, pag survey, may questionnaire checklist ka dyan. So, pag binasa mong mabuti ito, makikita mo na na, ah, ito yung mga gagawin. Kasi, ito naman yung mga magiging output niya. Okay? So, malinaw, di ba? Ngayon, meron ka ng paradigm. Meron ka na nitong illustration na to. E di, ang kasunod na nun, yung label niya. Figure 1 siya. Hindi siya table. Figure. So, conceptual model of the study. Or, sinusulat siya ng ganito. Figure 1, period. Conceptual paradigm of the study. Minsan, pinapadagdag kung ano yung title ng study. So, conceptual paradigm of the study showing the assessment of the Ganon. So, depende kung ano yung advice ng iyong advisor or ng inyong research professor. Okay. So, format kanina. Paradigm and then the explanation. So, eto na yung explanation niya. Figure 1 shows the conceptual model of the study on the... So, pwedeng palitan na lang to. This could serve as a template actually. So, on the basic level, pwede mo nang gamitin to. Palitan mo na lang yung mga naka-underline at saka yung iba pa para maging akma sa study mo. Okay, the first frame. So, pinaliwanag mo anong laman ng first frame. Sumunod, the second frame. Okay? The third frame. At yung mga arrow, wag mong kalimutan. So, the arrows from the input to the process and to the output, anong paliwanag? Bakit may arrow yan? And of course, yung isa pang arrow from input to output so, yakita natin to, di ba? Meron ka tayo niyan. Yan, yung arrow na yan, anong ibig sabihin yan? Papaliwanag mo rin yan. Yun yung explanation. Commonly, inuuna nila yung explanation. Actually, mas madali kung nauuna yung model kesa sa explanation. Pero it depends. It depends sa format at sa suggestion ng inyong teacher. Okay, ito yung pangalawang study. So, kanina kung may IPO tayo, ito naman IVDV. Kasi dito, matinde yung interaction ng iyong independent variable sa iyong dependent variable. Kapag meron ka nito, anong mangyayari dito? Okay? May cause and effect na nangyayari. Pagka 2 hours ka bang nag-review, mas mataas ang grade mo. Kapag 1 hour ka bang nag-review, mas mababa yung grade mo. So, depende anong tutuklasi ng iyong study. So, dito sa halimbawang to, titingnan natin yung relationship ng independent variable at saka dependent variable. So, IVDV model naman to. Halimbawa, 
sa iyong IV independent variable, meron kang computer skills at ano yung mga specific computer skills? Okay, ano yun? Marunong kang gumamit ng ganitong app, marunong ka nito, marunong ka mag-edit. Yung iba kasi marunong halimbawa ng PowerPoint, marunong halimbawa sila sa Word, sa Excel, pero hindi sila marunong mag-video editing. So, ano yung mga specific computer skills? Ililista mo yan dito. At kasunod nun, halimbawa, eto ha, kasama sa study mo lang, halimbawa, learning styles. Ano-ano yung mga specific na learning styles, halimbawa. So, hindi ka rin manghuhula. Babasahin mo sa literature mo, sa mga RRL mo, nandun nakalaman kung ano yung mga specific na learning styles. Kaya nga, uulitin ko, nakapagbasa-basa ka na, medyo buo na yung RRL mo para malinaw at tama yung nakapaloob sa iyong conceptual framework. So, ano nga yung study mo ulit? Effects of computer skills and learning styles. Saan? On the academic performance of higher education students. So, dalawa. Ang IV mo, computer skills and learning styles. So, eto yung nakaka-apekto sa academic performance nino ng higher education students o kung sino man yung specific respondents mo. Okay. Kaya ang IV mo, computer skills, learning styles. At ang DV mo, dependent variable, ay academic performance of higher education students. So, yan yung relationship na titingnan mo sa iyong study. Mas maraming computer skills mas advanced na computer skills, mas magandang learning styles, nangangahulugan ba na mas mataas ang academic performance? That we do not know yet. Depende yan sa makukuha mong data sa iyong research. Kaya magandang alamin. Halimbawa, mas nagtatagal sa social media, mas konting oras sa social media, Sino sa kanila ang may mas magandang academic performance? Okay, so that is for conceptual framework. The given examples pertains to social research for humanities and social sciences. However, when we apply that information to our scientific study, we can have this example. Title of the study, The Effect of Light Intensity on the Growth of Bean Plants. We have input, process, and output. So the input are your independent variable, your control variable, the quality of the soil, water temperature hypothesis, process, the dependent variable, experimental procedure the data collection output is your data analysis findings conclusion recommendations okay so that's for our conceptual framework basically this framework in doing our conceptual framework we will create a visual presentation using a flow chart or a diagram. There are other formats aside from input process output. You can start with uh, labeling it for your title and branch out with boxes for input process output. Then you connect the boxes with this, these arrows here. Tapat, ano siya? From edge to edge. No gap. Within the, the space. So, in the process here, we will have the experiment design procedure. Then, in the output, we have the data analysis findings, conclusions, recommendations. So, you will have arrow connecting them sequentially, sequence. 
So, let us proceed with the definition of terms. How is it important? Why is it important? Definition of terms is essential to our study because this ensures that your audience, including readers and peers and evaluators, can clearly understand the specific meanings or context of the terminology you use. So sometimes the words or the terms are not familiar with your readers, so you should clearly define those terms so we have types like in-text definition glossary footnotes or endnotes acronyms and abbreviation so in-text definition when introducing a new term provide a brief this definition in the text where it used this definition should be concise and relevant to the context of your study you can make glossary uh, this is a list of specialized terms you use in your study in alphabetical order footnotes you can use footnotes or endnotes to provide definition of terms when they are first mentioned then acronyms or abbreviations when using acronyms provide a definition or explanation the first time you use them then on the second time you can use the abbreviation So, it, let us have a, an example of in-text definition. You can say that in this study, photosynthesis, the process by which plants convert light energy into chemical energy is a key factor in our investigation. So, you can have this in-text definition in any part of your paper. Usually, you can see this one in the introduction. Then, glossary. A list of terms footnotes at the end at the bottom part of your page uh, example you can write the definition of photosynthesis in the footnote of your paper to give the full definition of photosynthesis then in the acronym Example, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization or UNESCO works to promote global education. So, at first, you will give the, the, the explanation or the complete name before the abbreviation. And the next time you use that one in your paragraphs, you use down na the acronym okay so let us watch again another video for basta asa po ni 15 minutes definition of terms hi welcome back to my channel kumusta na ang thesis mo nasa writing stage ka ba o nasa editing stage na wow ano man ang stage mo sa iyong thesis writing ay mahalagang tama ang part na ito ng iyong manuscript aling part po ma'am so definition of terms mahalaga ang definition of terms na tama ang nilalaman kasi pagkatapos ng title mo kung anumang words ang nasa title mo susunod na titingnan ka agad ng panel or kung sino mang reader ng manuscript mo yung definition ng mga words na ginamit mo doon halimbawa ang thesis title mo ay online learning strategies and its effects to the critical thinking skills of grade 12 students Okay, so ano yung mga significant words doon sa title mo? Meron kang online learning strategies, meron kang effects, meron ka pang critical thinking skills. So kailangan yung mga words na yon ma-prioritize sila na ma-define sa iyong definition of terms. During defense, pagtingin sa title ng iyong panelist, Malamang itatanong niya kaagad, anong ibig sabihin ng online learning strategies? Anong tinutukoy mong effects? Ano yung critical thinking skills? So, ipapaliwanag mo. That's one option. Another option is 
you can direct them to your definition of terms. So, saan nga ba matatagpuan ang definition of terms? So, nasa chapter 1 ba yan? Nasa chapter 2, 3, 4, or 5? Okay, anong hula mo? Okay, so ang definition of terms ay siya yung huling-huling part under chapter 1. Okay, nandun siya. So, napakadali niyang tandaan kasi bago ka pumunta sa chapter 2, matatagpuan mo ang definition of terms. So, karaniwan talaga binubuklat yan. Ako bilang panelist, for example, tinitingnan ko ang definition of terms kaagad kasi pag na-encounter ko yung terminology na to sa title, titingnan ko kaagad siya. Ano kaya ang ibig niyang sabihin sa pagkakagamit niya dito? Minsan kasi, yung nasa title na terminology, minsan kung ano yung understanding mo, iba pala yung pagkakagamit doon sa konteksto ng study na yon o ng research na yon So, mahalaga na iisa or my common understanding, ikaw, ang panelist, at kung sino man ang reader ng iyong thesis manuscript. Okay, so tingnan natin ngayon yung aktual na halimbawa ng isang definition of terms. So, ginamit natin dito sa ating screen ay mismong word. Kasi di ba yung thesis nyo ay isinusulat natin sa word, hindi naman sa PowerPoint, hindi naman sa Excel. So, dito meron tayong title or yung subtitle natin under chapter 1 na definition of terms. So, kailangan yan initial capital D and of course initial capital letter T. Okay, minsan nakakaligtaan kasi yan. Ako sa editing, for example, minsan nakikita ko pati yung T ay small letter. So, tandaan natin sa mga title or subtitle, importante na yung mga important words or yung mga essential words ay nagsisimula sa capital letter. So, of course, meron tayong introductory statement. So, dito sa halimbawang ginawa ko, merong dalawang options. Or, pwede naman gumawa ka ng sarili mong sentence para, kumbaga, ay may roon kang sariling style dito. So, usually, ito yung ginagamit dyan. The following terms used in the study are defined conceptually and or operationally to ensure clarity and better understanding. So, that's one option. Or, kung gusto mong ganito, for a better understanding of the study, the following words are conceptually and or operationally defined. So, ito yung tinatawag na introductory statement. Isa lang, pili ka lang dito kung anong gagamitin mo. Okay? Ngayon, kung napansin mo to, ma'am, bakit po may and or? conceptually and or operationally. Oo nga naman, bakit may and or? Minsan kasi, pwede na isa lang ang ilagay mong definition. Conceptual lang siya or operational lang siya. Okay? Pwede namang dalawa. Conceptual definition at operational definition. Kaya may end. Kung isa lang, e di or yun. Kung dalawa, end yun. So, may intro statement ka na. Ang kasunod na nun, yung mismong essential word or important word na bibigyan mo ng kahulugan. Okay. May dalawang uri ng kahulugan. Una, conceptual definition. Yung conceptual definition, saan nga ba nang gagaling yan? Okay. Yan ba ay sarili mong pagpapakahulugan? O kinuha mo sa mga reliable sources, sa mga references? Okay. Pag sinabing conceptual definition, galing yan sa mga sources. Hindi galing sa iyo. Okay? Yun ang kaibahan niya sa pangalawang uri na tinatawag nating operational definition. So, pag sinabing operational definition, hindi siya galing sa dictionary, hindi siya galing sa aklat, hindi siya galing kung saan reference, kundi siya ay nabuo, nakahulugan, batay sa kung paano siya ginamit sa iyong pananaliksik or sa iyong research. Okay, so dalawa, conceptual definition, operational definition. Automatically, pag may conceptual definition ka, kasunod niyan source kung saan mo siya kinuha. Hindi mo pwedeng hindi banggitin yung source kasi nga kinuha mo siya from that particular reference. Okay, so ito ang halimbawa. Development and acceptability. So, Wala siyang source. Sa biglang tingin, alam ko na na operational definition to. So, 
Anong sabi dito? It refers to the process of creating the learning material and assessing its extent of usefulness to the intended learner. So, halimbawa, ito yung binigay na pagpapakahulugan or kahulugan ng researcher. Kasi ito yung kung paano siya ginamit sa study. Okay, pangalawa, halimbawa, English conversation fluency. So, meron ang mga conceptual definition na tumatama sa study mo. So, kunin mo yung conceptual definition niya. So, sabi mo, it refers to the, okay, continuation, kung ano yung sabi dun sa pinagkunan mo, and then i-acknowledge mo yung source. Kasi nga, conceptual definition siya. Okay, dito naman, literature-based learning playlist. So, pangatlong entry na to sa definition of terms. Obviously, wala siyang source. So, this means that this is operational definition. Okay, this pertains to the developed learning material that comprises literary pieces as input materials. Okay, so halimbawa itong tatlo, mga importante ito kaya sila ay inilagay dyan. Halimbawa, sasabihin mo pa ba or ide-define mo pa ba na grade 12 students? So understood na na yung grade 12 students ay grade 12 students. Kahit hindi mo i-define dito, alam na ng lahat yun. Okay? Kaya ang tanong, mam lahat po ba ng nasa title ay ilalagay dyan? Hindi. Pipiliin mo lang kung ano yung pinakang importanteng salita na hindi madaling maintindihan or hindi siya usual na ginagamit. Kaya kailangan mong i-define dito sa part na to ng iyong study. Okay. So you can watch the full video of this presentation on our YouTube. So let us proceed with the third competency and that is to list the research hypothesis. So what is a research hypothesis? Research hypothesis is a tentative explanation which is proposed to answer your research question. Researchers use hypothesis to predict the relationship between variables. So, in research, a hypothesis is proposed explanation or educated guess about the relationship between variables to determine the validity. Researchers subject the hypothesis to subject research hypothesis to analytical investigation so this is known as the hypothesis testing it involves a rigorous examining examination and analyzing data to establish whether the hypothesis is supported or true or contradicted or false based on the evidence so, in writing quantitative hypothesis, the purpose of this is to narrow the purpose statement in quantitative research. But hypothesis advance a prediction about what the researcher expects to find. The researcher can make these predictions because of past studies in the literature that suggest certain outcomes. In addition, hypotheses are not used to describe a single, single variable as it is the case with research questions. They also are not used as frequently as research questions because they represent a formal statement of relationship and prediction of the relationship may not be known. Researchers narrow the focus of the study to and at least one hypothesis that provides a prediction about the outcome of your study. So these are the guidelines of making our hypothesis. State the variables in order, independent, dependent and control if you compare groups in your hypothesis explicitly state the groups if variables are related specific specify the relationship among the variables 
Then, you will make prediction about the change you expect in your group such as less or more favorable or no changes, no difference. So, you will then test this prediction using statistical procedure. You may state information about the participants and the site of the study, but this information may not be necessary if it repeats information stated in your purpose statement. Usually, this fourth one is not used. Example of hypothesis. So we have two types of hypothesis, the null and the alternative hypothesis. The null symbol is HO, alternative is H1 or HA. So what is the null hypothesis as a review? A type of hypothesis with, in which you assume that the sample observations are purely by chance, denoted as HO. Alternative is a hypothesis in which you assume that the sample observations are not by chance. It is affected by some non-random situation. And it, the symbol is H1 or HA. So I have here a table comparing the type of hypothesis. So the purpose of the null hypothesis is to test the general population that there is no change, no relationship, or no significant difference. Null and for no. So to remember, null hypothesis means no. There is no. There is no change, no relationship, no difference. And alternative hypothesis will that may be true if the null hypothesis is rejected. So, if there is no change, so there is change. It suggests a change, a relationship, and a difference. So, if you will remember, null means no. So, the alternative is, alternative hypothesis. There is a change. There is a relationship. There is a significant difference. Specific language found in the hypothesis, this is a general a script for null hypothesis there is no difference there is no relationship there is no significant difference for alternative hypothesis magnitude say statements such as a higher or lower or more positive or more favorable how researchers test the hypothesis a test of hypothesis through statistics Okay, so where are we now? We will go with the script, sample scripts for the null hypothesis. There is no difference between the independent variable and the another group of independent variables. So you are comparing two groups. In terms of the dependent variable. So it's not necessary to write this one anymore. Because it will become redundant with the purpose statement. Or the other parts of your research. So you just stop here in the dependent variable. Example, there is no difference between at-risk and non-at-risk students in terms of students' achievement on math test scores for grade third grade students in the Midwestern school district. So this is in social research. Alternative script comparing the group one. Independent higher, lower, or greater, or lesser on dependent variable than group two. Example, students who participate in learning or direct learning in for elementary schools will have higher achievement scores than students who participate in whole language learning. So we have non-directional. Here we have directional. So there is high, low. There is a direction. If it is high, low, great, or less, this is directional alternative hypothesis. When we say non-directional, there is no direction. You just state that there is a change. Example, there is a difference between group 1 and group 2 in terms of blank. So, you does not state that there is a greater, higher, lesser. So, there is no direction. That is 
non-directional. So, there are two types of alternative hypothesis. Remember, the directional and non-directional alternative hypothesis. So, in this non-directional, you just state that there is a difference. Example, there is a difference between varsity athletes and high school who smoke and those who do not smoke in terms of athletic accomplishments. Here, I have provided you a sample of hypothesis for scientific study. So, you state the problem. Purpose. Generally, this study aims to determine the moloxicidal activity of tea seed power against golden apple snail. Research question. Is there a significant difference in the mortality of golden apple snails exposed to varying con concentrations of tea seed powder. So, what is the independent variable? The varying concentration of tea seed powder. What is the dependent variable? The death of golden apple snails. Correct? Yes? Let us proceed with the hypothesis. Null hypothesis. There is no significant difference in the mortality of golden apple snails exposed to varying concentrations of tea seed powder. Alternative. There is a significant difference in the mortality of golden apple snails exposed to varying concentrations of tea seed powder. This alternative hypothesis, is this a directional alternative hypothesis or a non-directional alternative hypothesis? What do you think? So, this is a non-directional alternative hypothesis. Next, decision. So, we will use... Inferential statistics in the analysis of our hypothesis. Either we reject or we accept the, the null hypothesis in our statistical method. So, in the IMRAD format, the hypothesis is not exactly written similar to the given example. However, assumptions are stated in the last paragraph of the introductions and and the outcome of the statistical analysis is stated, discussed in and discussed in the result and discussion sections in the IMRAD. Example: the presence of bioactive compounds in the family of tobacco plant tested for moloxicidal property. It's assumed that it is ex it will exhibit similar property dependent on its concentration. So, as uh, I would like to clarify that. In our requirements, you will really write chapter 1, chapter 2, 3, and 4 as a general format for thesis study. However, in the submission of paper for our competition, you will just convert your previous writings into MRAD. It's easy because all of the elements for MRAD are there. So, we just need to write the whole four chapters and then we convert that one to MRAD later on in the time of your competition. Okay? That ends our topic for today. May God bless us always.